Your glory lives out through the age. All saints declare your great renown. Your kingdom forever will stand. Oh, we won't be shaken. We will not fear our God. Our God, a mighty warrior. You're a consuming fire. In victory you reign. We triumph in your name. Jesus, our great commander. You conquer death forever. In victory you reign. We triumph in your name. And we Good morning. It's a great way to start this morning off. We're glad you're here at Encounter Church. My name is Chris Causey. I'm the pastor here. And uh, today we're going to continue a series that we began last week called Heroes. And so excited for Jason's going to be giving you that next step in that hero's journey that we're all in the midst of uh, this month. If you're new here to Encounter Church, we want to welcome you. Whether you're joining us online or you're new in the room, we're glad that you chose to be here. We believe the next hour really can be the most hopeful and helpful part of your week. And there are so many things that are going on right now, even at this church, to help equip and to enable us to, to live that hope out um, every single hour that we have um, in our week. And it's one of the things that we've created for you that we talk about a lot, but if you're new, I just want to introduce you to is an app that we've created. And you can download it for free at EncounterChurch.com, uh, I think forward slash app. And uh, on that, you'll be able to follow the message notes, submit prayer requests, get connected here, learn more about the church. Uh, there's so many different things, and there's new features uh, that are going to be added even going into the fall. And so it's a great tool, a great way to get connected, and a great way to learn and grow and uh, explore and take a next step in faith, too, if you're interested in that. So thank you for being here today. The band's going to lead us in a few more songs. Jason will be up and continue the series, and then we'll wrap up with one song today. It's just a, a time to reflect and uh, process through the impact of today's message. So thank you for being in Encounter Church. Uh, we'll continue to sing. <laughs>
greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. There's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Our God is greater.
Today is the second week of our series called Heroes. I don't know about you, that music just makes me want to do something heroic. Anybody? I'm like, okay, show me the movie now, right? What do I do? Sign me up. Something. Um, we love heroes, don't we? And we have a lot of different thoughts and kind of connotations that happen in our mind and in our heart when we even say the word hero. And I'm pretty positive every other movie is a Marvel movie right now. Yes? Anybody? And so every now and then on a Friday night or something, Rachel and I will watch a movie and we'll say, well, hey, let's look around. And so we'll go to the Dish Network, whatever it is, and look around, you know, the different movies. I'm like, I don't think we've seen this one. And uh, Rachel says, I'm pretty sure we have. Well, it's probably because I fall asleep in movies. Anybody else? I think, you know, my wife, even like halfway through like a 30 minute show, she's like, Jason, I'm like, what? Are you asleep? No. Not now, right? That's why I don't remember the movies, but I think like every other Friday night, there's like a new Marvel movie, but it's, it's kind of a thing right now, right? And even at Disney World, our family had a chance to go and spend a week at Disney um, in April, and obviously the Disney characters everywhere, everyone's a, a hero. So whether we see something on TV or watch a commercial or a new movie, I'm sure there's one coming out Friday night by Marvel, probably Captain America um, number seven, something like that. Um, We like heroes, don't we? But in some ways, heroes, like Chris talked about last week, have an ingredient that just requires courage. And often it's not Superman that unveils himself and saves the day. It's not Captain America number seven. It's people like you and people like me that just have the courage to step up and do what needs to be done. In some way, heroes are ordinary. They are ordinary men and women, just like you and I, that just simply do what needs to be done. Now, we could talk about a lot of different people in a lot of different ways, but we can, how about cops? Every single day, they are heroes, are they not? Because they step into situations that are dangerous, and they put their lives on the line every single day. Firemen, and the list could go on with different people who sacrifice themselves, who sacrifice their time. Look at the military, right? So many of you have been in the military. So many of you know loved ones in the military. So some, some, many of you know people that cannot be at even church today because they are serving as a cop or they're serving as a firefighter, right? Ordinary people that do extraordinary things. When I was 18 years old, I had an extraordinary day. It was a hot August day in, in uh, South Carolina, and I was about to start my senior year at the University of South Carolina And as often happens in that time of the year, a terrible storm came up. And I'm traveling on I-20 westbound just outside of Columbia, South Carolina. And there before me, I saw someone hit the brakes. And just like yesterday, we celebrated uh, my son's ninth birthday, which is tomorrow on the Cape, coming back from on Route 3, coming out of the Cape yesterday. Just every now and then, and maybe that's just my fault, you just have to hit the brake. Why do you have to hit the brake, man? It's not your fault, right? Somebody answer me. The person in front of you, right? It's always their fault. Well, this time it was different. I-20 westbound, and I saw someone hit the brake and move move to the right. The moment the person that I saw slam on the brake and move to the right, the person behind them slammed on the brake and moved to the right. The person behind them slammed on the brake and moved to the right. And there before me was just a wall of water on the interstate. I was going 70 miles an hour. Shouldn't have been doing that. I was going speed limit, right? But too fast for conditions. I found out what that was that day. That's also a ticket right? Too fast for conditions. Well, my truck hit this body of water and I just started spinning. And as soon as I did the first spin on top of this body of water, I saw an 18 wheeler that was staring my vehicle in the face. Well, what happened when I turned around and hit one, the first 180, he swung towards me and I thought, what is he doing? You know, you can write a novel in the midst of like three seconds of trauma, right? You remember so many things that go through your mind. And I'm thinking, what is he doing? Well, he swerves his 18-wheeler and and traffic behind him hits the brake. A few cars hit the interstate wall. You know what he was doing? He was protecting me. He swerved his 18-wheeler over to make sure no one hit me because he knew that this was a blind spot and people were going too fast and the rain was coming down so hard. Well, I got out, hit the interstate wall a few times, walked away from it, very thankful uh, for that. Uh, Backed up traffic on the interstate for a couple of hours that day because there were six uh, vehicles that um, that ended up hitting the wall that day, me being the first one. That guy was a hero. You know why? He did what needed to be done. He didn't think about himself. He could have hit the brake. He was in the right lane. I was in the far left. He was in the right lane. He could have just hit the brake and said, poor guy, right? 
in an instant. He swerved an 18-wheeler, which is just a bad idea, and to protect me. And I looked at him. He said, I think you would have been killed had I not moved over. And I said, man, I just gave the guy a hug. I was very startled. My mom and my dad and a friend named Aaron came up to Columbia, and we went to, um, to the restaurant that night. As you could imagine, or for those of you that have been in a moment like that, you're not really ready for dinner, are you? I remember watching them eat their burger and fries and getting back into the vehicle. And about five minutes in, uh, down the road, I rode passenger, as you could imagine. There were two different vehicles that day. And I saw my dad swerve around us. We're on I-20 westbound, headed not back to my apartment in Columbia, but headed home for a couple of days, right? To kind of recoup from what just happened. Well, I looked to my right and I saw my dad swerve around my friend Aaron that was driving. And I looked in the rear view and I saw Aaron kind of do this, who's driving. She goes, and I looked behind me and I saw an 18 wheeler tipping like this on its side, left and right. And I reach over, not recommended anybody. I reach over and grab her leg and I say, hit the gas because I knew this 18 wheeler was about to flip. And the 18-wheeler overcorrected and made a mistake because they, because they honestly thought that my dad was going to run into him. The 18-wheeler turned like this, and this was two, about three hours after the first accident on I-20 westbound. And the 18-wheeler swerved, and the trailer on the back just flipped over, and the thing just started tumbling and tumbling and tumbling. Walmart t-shirts, free for the world, right? I mean, like 20,000 Walmart t-shirts went everywhere. And that truck was about 20 feet from hitting Aaron and about 40 feet because my dad saw it coming. Aaron saw it coming, but she froze and I grabbed her leg and said, hit the gas. And what am I to do? It was dark at that point, And I see an explosion in the rear view. Just go up. What am I doing? My heart is already done for the day, right? So I jump out the car and I look at my dad. I hear my mom's voice yelling. She's probably watching live online right now. If not, maybe later. Sorry, mom, about this story, bringing up bad dreams for you. But I hear my mom's voice yell my name because she thought I was in it. And I hear my mom say, basically in a nice way, be quiet, Vicky. He's fine. Stay here. My dad and I run and climb over the 18-wheeler wreckage to see a fire and about 10 vehicles in a pileup. That day was one of the most traumatic events of my life. But you know what it opened the the door for? It opened up the door for people to step in and just do what needs to be done. The 18-wheeler in the first accident that day did what needed to be done to protect me from dying. Right? The second time, there there was a man named Travis that I met. I still remember his face to this day. I probably remember a lot of faces of people I will never meet. To this day, I remember him just going from vehicle to vehicle to vehicle, just pulling people out. And that night when I got home, as you can imagine, I did not sleep. I saw all over the news two uh, I-20 westbound major accidents, you know, in a matter of three hours. And I was like, you're welcome. You know, I'm like, that was me. I felt scared and terrified and famous for all the wrong reasons, right? But I mean, this is a crazy day. But I, I saw in the midst of what firefighters and people that are in the military and people that have experienced traumatic events see every day, there are ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Why? Because they just need to be done. And that day I saw people, thankfully I didn't see, no one, no one passed away that day. There were many folks that made a trip to the hospital in the second accident, but no one passed away that day. I was very, very, very grateful. In fact, for years I passed by, especially throughout graduate school, the trees that were knocked down off of the interstate from the actual truck that detached from the trailer and went into the woods. He was, he, he's probably living to this day because, um, because of the way that it detached. But I saw heroes step up that day and they did what needed to be done. One of the most extraordinary heroes that we get to talk about Sunday in and Sunday out is a man named Jesus. What I love about Jesus is not just because I'm a pastor, but what I love about Jesus is that he is one of the most talked about, sought after, right, in his teachings and written about figures ever to walk the face of the earth. Actually, in the, in the end of the Gospel of John, the fourth book of, of the New Testament, John even says something, who walked with Jesus, right? This was said over 2,000 years ago. He said, if there were enough, if, you know, all the things that Jesus did are basically, they're not written down. We're only capturing, when John wrote about these things, we're only capturing a few of the things that Jesus did. But if we were to write about all of them, there would not be enough libraries in all the world to capture what he did. It's one of my favorite, like, little verses 
in all of scripture, the very end of John, he's like, by the way, before I, before I finish this, wow, there's so much more. I just get even choked up thinking about a man talking about Jesus who just knew him for a few years. He goes, guys, there's so much more. Today, the most printed uh, you know, piece of literature on the planet is the Bible centered in history around a man named Jesus who was a hero. Why was he a hero? Because Jesus did what needed to be done. But one day Jesus told a story. And I love that we have this story. Remember, there's a lot of stories that aren't captured. There are a lot of things that he did and said, things that he done that aren't captured, right? But this one, I love that we have a, a, a history and a recollection of, of Jesus' story. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the Good Samaritan. Anybody? Yeah. So e- even if some people aren't familiar with this story, uh, a lot of times it's even like uh, kind of something that people say, oh, he's a good Samaritan, right? If you went to people today, 10 people say, tell me the story of the good Samaritan. Maybe one or two, maybe three, four, uh, probably not more than four could actually recount the story. But we know the good Samaritan as someone who does a good deed. Well, Jesus tells an extraordinary story. And this extraordinary story is found in Luke chapter 10. And the extraordinary story was not just because of the plot line, but it's really because of the characters that he chose to tell. So read with me in just a few verses. We're going to read Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Read a few verses. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So we'll keep it there for just a moment. An expert in the law, stood up to do what to Jesus? What did he stand up to do? To test him. Okay, just remember that. We'll come back to it. Verse 26, Jesus responds, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Jesus answering a question with a question. This was not only a Socratic method that was um, well known to certain fields of education. The Socratic method is a is a method of learning that asks questions. And the person that asks more questions can often find more answers. And so the intellectual brain, as we grow older, we have a tendency to actually close our kind of neuropaths of learning, right? Because we learn a certain thing and we say, oh, I understand that, I understand this. The Socratic method is a great way of learning right? that rabbis in the Jewish context would often use. And they would often answer a question with a question. This is exactly what Jesus did. But Jesus was being tested, remember? Now, imagine that. A lawyer testing a Jewish rabbi. Not someone who only wrote the law, but someone who practiced the law and enforced the law. Stood up, meaning everyone's sitting down. So Jesus stands up, or the expert in the law, stood up and said, Jesus, I have a question for you. So imagine a a group of folks. And and he says, hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And imagine Jesus. I mean, in, in a sense, I don't think Jesus is being smart or being snooty necessarily. He's just being a good teacher. And he turns it back on him. What is written in the law? How about that for a lawyer, right? If a lawyer ever asked you a question, you know the law. You answer the question. And then he says this, well, how do you read it? Now, Jesus, before he even gives the the lawyer a chance to to, to answer the question, Jesus says, how do you read it? Jesus assumes you know what it says, right? We had a man of great intellect that's kind of searching and curious. I visited Encounter a couple of years ago. And after the service, he just asked me a couple of questions. And I knew in the back of my mind, this guy's sharp. He's not asking me. Because he does not know the answer. He knows his answer. He wants to know my answer. He was asking me questions about Jesus, questions about the Bible, questions about its validity, right? And I said, I stopped him. I remember this. I didn't call him out like Jesus called the lawyer. I said, you're asking the question because you know the answer, don't you? And he just kind of smiled. I said, how do you, what do you think about it? He said, let's go to coffee this week. So we've had great conversation. We've connected over the last couple of years. He's just such a great guy and such a sharp intellect. Well, Jesus is calling him out. You're a lawyer. You know the law. What does it say? How do you read it? Reading on in verse 27, he answered, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28 says, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. Now, this is a good answer, right? 
If you did not know this story, and I was kind of telling you the story, and I said, guess what his answer was? To love God with all of your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. You're like, that's pretty, I don't know if that's like the right answer. You ever given a good answer? Like, I have a good answer, but I don't know if it's the right answer. Or when a, when a teacher asks a question, you're like, I don't know if this is what you're looking for, right? <laughs> well, well, tell me what you're looking for. I believe in the Socratic method. Um, by the way, when I entered into seminary, I had one WF on my transcript from the University of South Carolina. It was Christian theology. Now, here it is, a pastor going into seminary, ready to study theology, and I had an F on my transcript. My seminary said, so tell me about this F. I was like, well, it's a WF. Let me clear that, right? Let me just clear the air. I withdrew from the class because I was failing the class. I mean, I passed all my music and and sociology, you know, and so I, I did have a pretty good reason. But I had a professor who did not want my opinion. And he asked to defend the Trinity. This is this, I, this theological idea that God is one distinct. He's not three gods. He's one God, but he has these three distinct persons. And whether you've grown up in a religious environment or not, um, some people that have and some people that have not, most people have heard of this idea of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This idea that there are three distinct identities, but it's just one God. It's not three different gods operating in three different ways. It's one God. And so he asked a question to defend the Trinity. I thought I did a pretty good job, right? I mean, I quoted some Bible verses. I quoted some different theologians. Well, I got a 17 on that test. And he said in bright red, you teachers who should demolish your red pens, because I still remember it. He said, I wanted my opinion, not yours. And so my seminary said, sorry about that. You know, <laughs> when I told them the story, they were like, okay, we get it. So I withdrew from the class because I said, hey, can I, can I do anything to, to kind of get this grade up? I mean, he said, no, you're not listening in class. I said, no, I listen in class. I just don't believe what you believe. Can, can I believe what I believe? Now, that's another message for another day, right? This is a University of South Carolina, and I had this conviction that the Bible is actually true, that what the Bible says was written by people that were contemporaries of Jesus, right? People that believed in him, people that experienced God, not just theologians, and he didn't like me saying that. But yeah, I got enough on this class. Well, this lawyer knew what he believed, and he answered the right way. He gave the great answer. He quoted the Old Testament scripture that which Jesus would have memorized as a rabbi, right? And so he quotes this Old Testament. He said, yeah, good job. Then he says this. We can even put this back on uh, the screen for just a moment. The end of verse 28, do this and you will live. Now that the lawyer probably wasn't ready for. Because he said to go do it. So no, 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 I get it. I get it. I get it. I asked, how can I inherit eternal life? I don't want to die forever. I want to live forever. How can I do that? Because I know that you, you, as a rabbi, you understand like what that looks like and what the afterlife. Tell me, how do I do it? And Jesus said, just go do what the law says. Do this and you will live. What is what does the lawyer say back, back in verse 29? Check this out. He says, but he wanted to justify himself. Imagine that. Now, we can point fingers at the lawyer, but we can also kind of point those fingers right back at us. If this was a conversation between you and Jesus, you'd say, ah, okay, I'm doing that. I love God. I'm not opposed to God. Like, I, I love God. I'm thankful for him. I'm, I think I'm doing a good job of loving people. And yeah, I'm, I'm kind of doing that. You probably want to justify yourself with Jesus. I, I, I am. I love my spouse. I, I, I'm, I'm kind to my coworkers. I'm, I'm even kind to strangers, even though they're not necessarily kind to me. Like, right? And so you could justify himself. That's what he does. He says, and who is my neighbor? So obviously, in a sense, this, this lawyer was, was new for himself. I'm, I love people, but who are you talking about? Because I get the love God part, but what about the people? Like, who? Who is the neighbor? That's a great question, Right? And I believe, my speculation based on this, I I believe he genuinely wanted to know what Jesus, the rabbi, thought when he said, neighbor, who are you talking about? Because you tell me to do this and you will live. And I think you want to hear that message, don't you? If you see from the scripture, the Bible says, do this and you will live. You're like, okay, tell me more. Like in all the Bible... There are some thin line Bibles and there are some big study Bibles, right? You got this whole Bible. You're like, I don't know where to start. I don't know. Old Testament, New Testament. You say the gospel of John. I don't know where to find this. Like how? It's just overwhelming. What if I said there's this one verse that says, do this and you will live. You'd say, tell me more. Right? Even the skeptic would say, tell me more. 
right? Tell, well, tell me more about this. Well, this is what the lawyer is saying. He says, hey, tell me more. I want to hear more. And, and so the lawyer understood love God. He didn't ask about that. I got that. But what about the neighbor? Who are you talking about, Jesus? Well, Jesus, instead of giving him a direct answer, gives him a very solid indirect answer by telling him a story. In verse 30, I'm going to read the story to you. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have. And some of you might be familiar with that story, and others of you might not be. But I can assure you, if you heard that story, the way that the lawyer heard that story, it's very, very different than today. Um, went for a run this morning, and um, imagine this, I was thinking about this, actually, when I was on a run, and we went through a park, and there were some folks quite early in the park. If I just went up to those folks in the park, and I was thinking about this, how would people really receive this story today? I think they would say, wow, good for the Samaritan. Right? Good for him. Right? I know that story. Good, good for him. Uh, the lawyer wasn't thinking that. The lawyer wasn't thinking that. Now, let me contextualize this for just a moment. If I, in the civil rights day, in the deep south of Alabama, went to a community that was primarily, you know, obviously segregated, where segregation was expected and it was approved by law, that there were the white man's bathroom and the colored man's bathroom. And I went into that cafe and I said, hey, gentlemen, let me tell you a little story. There was a man that went from Birmingham, Alabama to, you know, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, right? The first was a white man who, I'll tell the rest of the story. The second was a white man, but the black man is the man who took care of him. Could you imagine that would be a little bit different? Because of the racism, of the deep south, right? In the days before the civil rights movement, I tell a story, right? And so the lawyer, he's hearing this. Wait, 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 wait. The two religious people, the two people that were affirmed and accepted in his culture, like they just passed on by. Now I could imagine I wouldn't make it as a white man or a black man telling that story. I would not make it very long in that cafe, would I? Can, can somebody tell me I might not make it out of the cafe, right? If I told this story, this is a deep-seated racial issue, an ethnic issue in this day. First, Jesus says a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and the man's like, well, why is he going there, right? So we can assume that he is a Jew leaving Jerusalem. Well, he gets beaten by robbers, and there's two people that do nothing. Two people. Who were those two people? They were both religious people. Now, this is Jesus. Everybody answer this out loud. Was Jesus religious? Yes. He's telling a story about other religious people, a priest of the day. Okay, all right, well, and maybe he said, well, the priest did not stop to take care of him. Well, maybe there was an issue with him. Maybe he, was, maybe he thought he was dead, or maybe there was a reason he didn't. Maybe he was in a hurry. I mean, whatever excuse you have, right? And he just passed on by, didn't do anything. The second one, he says, a Levite. <clears throat> now, listen. The tribe, if you think about the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, descended from one of the sons named Levi. And the Levites were a called out tribe that were responsible for taking care of the sanctuary. They were responsible for carrying out the rituals like they were like God's priests. Like if Jesus Christ came today and started a church, right? If he started a church, he said, hey, I got these people over here. They're going to be like my leaders. They're going to be like, the, you know, the ones that carry out what I say, right? They're, they're the leaders of the church. This is the tribe of the, you know, the, of the Levites, well, Jesus quotes and says, a Levite even passed by, like one of my people that I called out. He didn't go into that story. But this is like, a Levite passed by? 
And you could imagine if the lawyer was trained and understood a little bit of Jewish history coming from a Jewish teacher, he goes, wow, I'm sorry about that, Jesus. Even the Levite didn't like he was one of your one of your people, right? No, he didn't take care of him, but a Samaritan. Now, this is kind of where the tensions rise up, right? In the, in, in the midst of, of racial tensions. And by the way, I mentioned Alabama, you know, deep south and pre-civil rights. That's in your neighborhood, like that same racial, and I know that that exists today. That's all over the news today. That's in from Boston to L.A., and that's on every planet and every tribe and every nation. There are racial tensions. There are racial issues. In some ways, things have gotten better. In some ways, things have gotten worse. And so I don't reference that to say that it doesn't exist today because assuredly it does, and it's very, very, very present. Some of you have experienced it even, even recently, right? It's very present. But I say that to say what was culturally acceptable in the day. It was culturally acceptable in this day for Samaritans and Jews to not mix. It's just okay. You, don't, you go here, you go here, all right? We, don't, we just don't mix. We just stay separate. And that was okay. But Jesus says a Samaritan was passing by and he stopped. And what did the Samaritan do? In short, what he should have done. He should have done what the priest should have done. What the Samaritan did was in short what the Levite should have done. He should have met the need. And Jesus tells a story about someone, about a people who is very opposite, right, than the Jews, and even not accepted by the Jews. And in other stories, we read that Jesus traveled through Samaria, Samaria, uh, the land where the Samaritans lived. Jesus traveled through Samaria when it was not acceptable to travel through Samaria. Jesus did that. Why? Because Jesus was a leader, and Jesus was showing courage, and Jesus was a hero. But Jesus tells a story about a hero. It wasn't Jesus in this story. It was a Samaritan. And what the Samaritan did was extraordinary. If you look back and even the verse uh, 34, he went and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He took his own goods and he, he poured them over the man that was wounded. And then he put the man on his donkey. Now, I don't know about you, if you could just picture a donkey for just a moment. Is there, is there much room for more than one? Right? I mean... You shake your head, yes, go ahead and take a ride on a donkey with two or three folks, right? And these are small animals, right? He put him on there and he probably walked the rest of the way, right? Depending on which way he was going and how far, um, the the stretch between Jerusalem and Jericho was treacherous. Almost, I believe, a 4,000 foot sea level drop. And it was very rocky and often unsafe. And it was very commonly known that this is an unsafe stretch of territory, Uh, because of the people that travel to and from. And so even Jesus' story connected, would have connected with anyone in that day. So yeah, it's kind of unsafe. I mean, you know, maybe at times, depending on who you are, uh, he took his oil and his wine more than likely that he would have went and purchased in the city and taking back to his family. So he sacrificed his own goods and took care of this man. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out money to pay for it. I and mean, that's good, right? Cause he took him to an inn. He took out money and he obviously had some things to do. And he looks to the innkeeper and he says, look after him, right? He pays probably not just for his night in the room, but he pays the innkeeper to continually look after him and says, basically, if there's any extra expense, right? I mean, I don't, I don't think this guy had a credit card, but, you know, you go, to the, you go to the resort or you go to the hotel and you give your credit card for incidentals. It's not an accident, right? It's just very purposeful, right? Hey, if there's any incidentals, charge it to me, and I'll come back. I'll come back. This would have blown the minds of the listeners. I could imagine not just the expert in the law, but anyone standing around still long enough to hear this story goes, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Not me. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that. I mean, this would have made the audience furious. In the same way I gave that illustration of the Deep South today, if I told that story in certain communities in the county where we live today, it would make people mad, right? Because we're often so prejudiced, so selfish, so about ourselves. And Jesus tells a very, very tense, tense story. And he says this at the very end, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. 
Verse 36 says, which of these three, uh, uh, we can just keep going and do likewise up there, but the, the previous verse for just a moment, he says, which of these three, listen, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell? You ever asked a question and it's so obvious you actually don't want to answer it? It's kind of like an insult. Sometimes that's from a teacher that hasn't set the appropriate context. And, and you kind of, you hear the teacher and the audience is like, uh, do we answer or do we not? It's kind of like awkward, like whether you're in like a middle school environment or a college classroom or like elementary, like do we answer or not? Sometimes teachers can set the stage super clearly. And they say, listen, I want you to think about this question for just a few moments. And they ask a rhetorical question. Or sometimes they don't give a kind of a context or a setting for it. They just ask a question and the people are like, does he really want the answer? Because it's kind of obvious, right? Or if you're like in a, in a spiritual setting and you're like, ask a question about God and everyone's thinking, I think we know the answer is yes. You know, it's like an obvious thing. And, and he, Jesus probably even added to the tension between he and the lawyer at that moment. Jesus not trying to make him feel tense. Jesus just answering the question the way that Jesus wanted to answer the question. Who do you think the neighbor was? And this is kind of more than likely not a rhetorical question. Because, he, hey, who do you think it is? And I'm sure the lawyer was like, well, of course, the, the good neighbor was the Samaritan. He was the one that was the good neighbor. What? An incredible answer to a simple question. Who's my neighbor? You know what Jesus' answer is? The person that has a need. The person that has a need. And he says this, go and do likewise. Now, he's already said it twice earlier in the the passage. You might remember that Jesus tells the story. He says, in the midst of it, he says, do this and you will live. You're like, all right, tell me more. Tell me more. I want to know. Like, I'm here at church. I'm open. I, I, I want to believe in God. I want to place my faith in him. Like, I'm, I'm here because I'm here, right? I want to be here. Do this and you will live. Well, tell me more. When Jesus says, here it is. If you do this, you will live. Love God and love people. And that love people goes beyond the people that you already love. Hello? Right? That love people, it breaks the boundaries of people and time and place and ethnicity and background socioeconomic differences. Jesus broke it all. And Jesus broke it all by saying this. I want to put this on the screen for you. Jesus redefined neighbor. Jesus redefined neighbor for everybody in every nation, in every generation. Look at that with me. Jesus redefined neighbor for everybody in every nation and in every generation. We could go anywhere in the world today and tell this story and it would raise up a lot of different emotions because I believe every single country on this planet has the same issue that Jesus was dealing with when he dealt with people that lived in Jerusalem that were Jews and people that lived in Samaria that were Samaritans. There's a divide. There's a divide of people. There's a divide of, of, of people because of prejudice. And Jesus broke it down. Do you want to know what love God means? It means to love God with all your heart. Give him your life, right? And you know what love your neighbor means? It means to love the people that have needs all around you, no matter who they are, no matter where they're from, no matter the color of their skin, no matter their socioeconomic background. Love those people. Jesus answered the question, who is my neighbor? And he answered it by defining the hero of the story. And the hero of this story was not the priest. It was not the pastor, right? It wasn't the Levite. In some ways, I'm like, Jesus, I mean, you should have made it the Levite, right? He should have been the hero of the story because like, he's living up to his expectations. But no, 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 Jesus redefined it and said anyone can be a hero. The hero in this story was the Samaritan. Right? It wasn't the religious. It wasn't the priest. It wasn't the Levite. So what does a hero do? A hero is someone who loves his neighbor. That's a hero today, guys. A hero is someone who has the courage to love your neighbor. And that's not just the people on your street, the people in your cul-de-sac. Those are the people that have needs, the people that, that have needs around you that you know you can meet. You can be a hero this week for someone. Why? Because you see a need 
and because you meet that need. You can be the same hero that the Samaritan was in that story by not walking by. And I don't know about you, I'm guilty of this, but we walked right by. We, we walked right by. Physically, we can walk by the street. If we like see someone homeless, yeah, okay, I can't solve every homeless person's problem, so we walk by. It's not just that walk by. It's like the other walk by when you see an email or when you hear about a need and you know you can meet it, right? A hero steps up to the plate and meets the needs of those who have them. Ultimately, Jesus was a hero. Do you know why? Because Jesus did what needed to be done. He told the story about a hero that day, but Jesus was a hero by what he did for you and I on the cross. Jesus did that day what no one else could do. What Jesus did that day by dying on the cross was he gave his very life. Remember the Samaritan gave his oil and his wine and his money, his time. Jesus gave his life so that you and I could experience eternal life. In fact, in John chapter 11, when Jesus says, I am the resurrection, like the resurrection meaning to resurrect, to come back from the dead, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me will never die, even though he dies. Sometimes I go to funerals and I don't even hear that. I like the funerals I go and I hear that, right? I like the funeral that I go to and I hear there is a promise of eternal life. This whole, this whole thing that I just read to you, it's a story about a man who wants to live forever. Anybody else? Go ahead, raise your hand. Yes, it's you, right? This isn't like, yes, voluntarily. Like, I want to live forever. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will never die, even though he dies. There's a promise that Jesus extends to each and every single person in every generation, every background, every country on this world, in this world today. And he offers himself. He died on the cross. He rose again from the dead. And he proclaimed this message that anyone who believes in me can live forever. Jesus was the ultimate hero because he did what needed to be done. But he was the only one that could do that. And Jesus is our hero. But we can respond to that in one of two ways. We can place our faith in him. We say, you know what? That's me. I want to place my faith in him. I'm like that expert in the law, and I'm not necessarily a lawyer, but I'm, I'm like him. I'm curious, and I, and I want to know, okay, and I would, I would respond to that message, to this story, and go, okay, I want to be that Samaritan. We'd love to talk with you about what that looks like. As a pastor, we have other people that would love to chat with you too, to say, hey, I, I want to know. You stop by a starting point and say, I'm, that's kind of me. I'm, I want to explore. I'm curious about what it really looks like to love my neighbor and to love God, right? And the second thing you can do, especially for those of you that have kind of already a faith in Christ, we have a command to go and love our neighbor. And it doesn't matter who or where, or often even what the need is. But we can, you can be a hero this week, and I can be a hero this week by loving our neighbor. Let's pray. God, thank you for the incredible story that you've given us. Even we think about um, people that don't even know the story can say the Good Samaritan. In many parts of the world today, this story is known because of you, because of this incredible story that you lived out yourself by giving your life. And so, God, we're grateful. We're grateful that we can read this story and that we can respond today and say, I want to be like the Good Samaritan that I want to cross every so-called boundary and love people the way that you love them. So help us to do that today. Help us to even think about people that come to our minds. Think about the places where we need to go and think about the needs that we know we can meet because of what you've told us to do. We're thankful, Lord, for um, every person that's listening online. We're grateful for every opportunity that we have to connect. We pray in these next few moments as we sing a song that you would continue to work on our hearts in whatever way you seek to do. We're grateful for this time in Jesus name. Amen. Over these next few moments, we're going to sing one more song uh, together and we're also going to take an offering. And for those of you that call and encounter church home, we have a very generous people that love to give even, even this week. And we're able to meet needs from time to time. You know, even this coming week, we are going to be able to meet a need that needs to be met in someone's life because of you. So if you've given last week or the week before, if you give today, know that encounter church wants to be a hero in people's life, right? We can't be a hero in everyone's life, but we want to do that just like you want to do that. So today, 
Even nationally, we have a, an organization that we're a part of that we give towards um, that's serving the homeless in cities around America today. We're still a part of some of the efforts to rebuild uh, portions of our country that have been demolished through um, natural disasters, and we're able to help because of you. So thank you for those of you that are able to give. Uh, we want to continue to be the hero in someone else's life. So thank you for your generosity. If you're a first-time guest, uh, your gift to us could be just to fill out the connection card, put that in the offering basket in just a few moments as it's passed around. As you get to know Encounter Church, we'd love to get to know you as well. Once again, thanks for being here. Stand, and we'll sing this song together.
creatures that watched in vain was borrowed for three days. His body there would not be made. Our God has wrought the was encouraging to you as you go out in your neighborhood, in your workplace, uh, wherever that may be, to show love to your neighbor uh, and meet a need this week and and today as well. Um, As you leave today, feel free to stop by Starting Point if you have questions about who we are or are looking to get more involved. Also, I wanted to remind you that we are still looking for volunteers for our community event. That's this next Friday, the 15th. We are hosting um, our movie night right here uh, at Encounter Church. We're going to have inflatables outside. We're going to be serving food. um, And we're going to have a movie right in the auditorium for um, families. And it's all free. So we are still looking for a few volunteers if you're interested in helping out with that. But also invite your neighbors, invite your friends uh, to come to that. And we would love uh, to see them here. Um, And as just a reminder, like that is one reason why uh, Encounter Church does these events is we want to show love to our neighbors. We want to show love to our community. And it's because of God's great love for us that we do those things. So I hope you have a wonderful day. We hope to see you again next week as we continue our series on heroes.